Well, I'm, I'm really honored to be here and I'm delighted to have a chance to talk to you all. So what are we going to talk about? Well, J Jennifer and Rebecca, have, uh, have some they, they're going to get us started and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll chat here. And in, in uh, fairness to, to Cheryl, promptly at three, I'm just going to do like this. Well, I'm cut, you'll be happy to know I'm cutting down my talk. I, I was writing it for something else and it got too long and I, so I've been working on cutting it down so you won't just fall over <laughs> bored out of your gourd in an hour or so. Yeah. So I, wanna, I need a little time to trim up a little bit in the end. Okay, well I think I was going to ask the first question. I um, actually spoke with Jessie Knock to get some ideas of things to ask you about. She mentioned that you were... Jessie Knock is... Uh, a PH, uh, yeah, she's a professor at Pitt, one of my former students, who, along with Jennifer, yeah, they were together. Um, and so I was wondering what uh, sort of research you're doing now. She mentioned that you were doing some work with identity strategizing or identity politics. Well, I am. I have to say that the work I'm doing now is mostly uh, related to 4C's work. So if any of you are ever thinking about being uh, going through the chair's rotation of four C's, I want you to do away with any other part of your life. <laughs> uh, it takes a lot of time. It's really wonderful work and, a, and thrilling work, but it does cut into one's research time and writing time. Maybe it didn't yours, but it's, it's did. plowed into mine. So I'm working uh, a lot on the four C's. I also am still working on textbooks, and I have a big um, four-in-one rhetoric coming out in January called the Harbray's Guide to Writing that I've been working on for about four years, and it's got a rhetoric, a set of readings, a research guide, and uh, a handbook, of course. So I think one thing that's important for those of us who are in rhetoric and comp and and I almost said competition. <laughs> but no, no, that's part of my four C's talk that I've already started working on. Uh, we can't be rhetoric and competition. We've got to be rhetoric and composition. But that's one of the th important things about being in rhetoric and, com and composition is our commitment to pedagogy. Rhetoric has always been a pedagogical tradition, starting with Socrates. And we can't let go of that. So I do have a textbook, a new textbook coming out. I'm doing some revisions on other textbooks. I have a piece coming out on mentoring that I did with two former graduate students. Uh, Jess Enoch and I have a piece that's been accepted by three C's that we've done on um, working in the archives and ideas about historiography. Um, it's interesting to me that my colleagues in communication arts and sciences think that his, historiography is the same as history. And they don't make, there's not much wiggle room there, except for somebody like Rosa. Somebody here knows Rosa. I mean, she would know that historiography is not the same as history. But Jess and I are really interested in history, which really doesn't exist without the the graphy, the orthography that writes it up and then it, it comes into being. And because both of us have done quite a bit of work in rewriting rhetorical histories and then at the same time revitalizing rhetorical theories, we're pretty interested in the methodologies of how one does that, particularly as more and more graduate students come through and they're doing different kinds of recovery work in rhetorical studies. My commitment, my professional commitment, continues to be making rhetorical study more inclusive of the people who use rhetoric well and more representative of all the rhetorics that are in play that go unnoticed. More and more young people coming through are doing that too. So we, we have a piece that we, we have one more revision to do if we can get it done before I leave for the Netherlands and before Jess has her baby. <laughs> uh, we'll be lucky. Uh, but we're... I, well, I'm leaving for the Netherlands Wednesday, so oh. we got to get it done before that. <laughs> and her baby's due a week from Wednesday, yeah. so we have a little time. She, maybe she can polish it up. We're pretty interested. <laughs> 
while she's waiting for the baby. <laughs> this is her off term. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty interested in working on methodologies and getting some out there. I, I think it's a big problem in, in rhetorical studies, not so much in composition studies, because we have some really great methodologies already in play that many of us use, and I hope every time we take them into our use, we improve them. That's what research is all about, taking what somebody's done maybe not so well, maybe pretty well, and trying to make it better. Uh, but in rhetorical, in rhetorical studies, our methodologies are still pretty murky, particularly the ones that go beyond reading yet another set of secondary sources on Plato, mm -hmm. and then writing once again what he might have met in the Republic. Uh, when, you, when you're out doing field work, when you're doing archival work, when you're, when you're working with oral histories, the methodologies are quite a bit different. And that's, what, that's one thing Jess and I are working on. Um, the project that I've been trying to get to, and I'm going to talk about this this afternoon, is about leveraging the rich work in identity studies that is already ac across so many fields, but rhetoric is is still the most conservative academic discipline, even more conservative than, if you can believe it, philosophy. <laughs> About leveraging the work that's already going on in identity studies with rhetorical studies so that we can s pay attention to the, the rhetorical performances that are happening in all sorts of groups, most of which we ignore. So I'm, I'm pretty interested in identity studies. I, ha I have to say that identity politics is also interesting to me. I think that identity politics can be um, paralyzing sometimes. But I also think if we didn't have identity politics, we wouldn't have the really great social movements that we've had, particularly here in the United States. And so I certainly don't want to do away or discourage identity politics. We still need, we still have so much more work to do, whether it's for identity politics having to do with health care issues or um, disability issues or gendered issues or those of cultural and ethnic groups that are non-Anglo, I would say. But there are times when we have I, I think we need to strategically transcend identity politics for a bigger uh, identity co coalition to do bigger things. So that's what I'm pretty interested in now. I think Rebecca, Is that enough? Yeah. I hope. Okay. <laughs> I know that her question that follows mine has to do with research method. Is that, is that the one you're going on? Oh, I can do that one. It's the one I've So it might be a follow-up to what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Like to, uh, when you're talking about your um, the, the oral field work that you did, um, after reading uh, Commanding Silence, um, I wondered what you think are the affordances and constraints of doing this type of interview-based research within the field of retcon. So personally, I'm very interested in pursuing more of this type of research on my own. So I was wondering what you had to say. Well, what's what's so interesting about about um, the chapter in Unspoken on Commanding Silence is that the people I was working with and, and providing a venue for their own words were thrilled. And uh, following the practice of ethno, uh, ethical ethnography, which is pretty much in play now, it's a pretty recent move. Um, I mean, that all worked out well. People liked what I mean, they, re they could, sometimes couldn't remember that they had said that when I'd send them a transcript. But if they wanted to fiddle with it, that was fine. Um, I was replicating a 1973 study, uh, Kenneth Basso's study. He's a retired professor. He's a, he was a Harvard grad at that time when he did it. And then he went out to University of Arizona. And then UNM, he was there, too, uh, doing field research. I was replicating his study because in his, in the book that came out of the 1973 study, he 
didn't quote anybody and he didn't name anybody and he just said what he saw and what he thought they said. So in, in a stance of ethical ethnography, I didn't intercede. And in fact, I didn't make enough opinions according to my department head. He wanted me to draw stronger conclusions from those interviews and I kept saying, but Robert, I really want them to speak for themselves because in the, you know, however long, 30 years ago, they didn't get to. Let them speak for themselves. And um, they were all pretty happy about that. I think that it's easier if you're doing it in your own cultural group because then whatever you write, people are going to just think you absolutely know what's going on. But if nobody's working in that cultural group, if I hadn't done that section in commanding silence, then somebody would have said most of the sociological and cultural anthrop uh, the sociolinguistic and cultural anthropology work on silence always lists Indians. You didn't even mention them. So you're, you think you're too good to mention them? I mean, you talked about Anita Hill. You don't think you're too good. So either way, it's, it's, it's complicated. But what I'm hopeful is that doing this kind of work will open up the door for other people to say, you know, she did a pretty good job. I think I could do better. I'm going to go into this group or this group or this group because really the more populated we are and the more diverse our, our, our group is, the better we're going to be as rhetoricians, as writing teachers, and as writers, and, and as human beings. So I love doing that chapter. Um, How long did it take you? It took, it took a long time to build the relationships. I, nev I mean, I had to do a lot of work. I have some, I have some ins. You, you might characterize, because probably not everybody here has read, read that book or that chapter. So could you give like the I could. sketch of I, I'm doing this and then I want to hear about building the relationship. Well, I, I'm, I'm doing this book on silence. I want to do this book <coughs> on silence. And I think the reason I got started, I, I didn't know why I got started on it. But now I think <laughs> the reason I got started is that one time my husband didn't get a job because uh, they, they told him he was too silent in the interview. And my husband's a really slow talker. In fact, that's our only problem in our marriage. I think he's done and I've left the room. <laughs> but he's Scandinavian. And he talks slow and there are huge pauses between his senses. And by that time, I can mow the lawn by the time he's ready to... And I'm a, not a slow talker. So I was pretty interested in silence. And I was so mad that somebody said, you couldn't have that job, you were too silent. And it really was just pauses, conversational pauses. So I thought, oh, that'd be kind of fun to work on. Okay. And so I thought, I'm going to do this work on silence. So I thought, well, you know, well, first of all, I'm going to start with a grammar of silence and see if I can get some parts to it. What, what it means. To, and so I started just reading. It was delicious reading about all the way silence is used poetically, soci socially, Politically, et cetera, et cetera. So I did it. I did one chapter on a grammar of silence. I did one talking about silence and silencing as gendered posi positions. I did one uh, chapter on the cases of Anita Hill and Lonnie Guineer, which really some of you are too young to have to have had that affect you, but it really affected me. In both cases, both women, uh, Anita Hill was was punished for remaining silent. And then when she came to speak, they said, well, you know, you're in trouble anyway. So she was doomed either way. And then Lana Guineer was asked to remain silent, and she was really punished for that. So, and then all the stuff with President Clinton happened. And you might remember that there were a string of women who came up and who, who had either remained silent, remained silent, 
or were asked to keep silent. So I wanted to see how it worked on the political stage. So I was looking at these different places and I thought, gosh, this is fun. Maybe I will try to replicate Keith Basso's study because everywhere I looked, uh, everything I was reading was, were, were assertions like, Indian children are always quiet, always silent in class. Indians will never talk to you if you run into them. If you have, they haven't seen you for a long time, they're not going to talk to you for, and I mean, just these huge assertions. And I thought, gosh, I know some Indian people, and I, I haven't really noticed that. So I was out working on a family project in the Doris Duke, Duke collection of the Center for Southwest Studies in the Zimmerman Library at University of New Mexico. I was out there for a month or so. And I was seeing some folks I knew, and, and I thought, well, maybe I'll just ask some, some some Indian people about, and I'm saying Indian because that's what they ask me to call them, not Native American, that's a white thing, you know, just Indian. Okay. So I said, you know, could, could we talk about this? And some people let me, and other people said, well, maybe next time you come. And it took, that took maybe four years and lots of trips. But um, I remember, I, have any of you ever read the poet Simon Ortiz? Okay, um, I was interviewing Simon's uh, nephew, Myris Chino, and and Myris said, "Well, maybe you could, maybe you could interview Simon sometime." But then, well, I went back to a festival and I saw Myris, and we were talking. He said, "Well, Simon's not here, but do you want to interview Earl Ortiz?" And I met Earl. I asked, asked Earl. He was the only one who agreed on the first meeting. And so I said to Earl, well, would it be all right? Would I, could I replicate this study with you? It's the Keith Basso study. Interesting. They all knew about Keith Basso's study. Mm -hmm. And he said, sure. So we, we met at the, the hotel lobby in Albuquerque, and um, I was interviewing him. And, and afterwards, I said, Earl, wh why did you let me interview you the first time I asked you? Because that's not happened before, and he said, because of the way you treated everybody. But then he said, um, some, some of my family left the Ohio branch of the family and moved out to the Pueblo. So I have relatives who are part white, but I'm not part Indian. Okay. So he knows all the family. He knows his family. So he said to me, it was nice to meet you, Cheryl. You're the first white Mormon I ever met. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty great, you know. But it took, it took a long time. Um, every time I interviewed someone, and this is all in the transcripts, people would say, uh, are you an anthropologist? I'd say no. And then they'd say, people would say, are you going to pay me? And I'd say no. And it was kind of a test. But I know, that I know about the trickster, and I know the tricks that have been played on anthropologists for, for years. You know, you just get paid, and you tell them whatever you want, and then you go buy what you want with your $200 or whatever you've got. So <clears throat> I would like to think everybody spoke the truth to me, because I didn't ask anything controversial. But you know what? They can do what they want. I asked the questions. They read the transcripts. They responded. It's... These are people that I have relationships with. I, I don't, so it's really interesting, and I think a lot more of that work needs to be done. But we can't go in as anthropologists, and we certainly can't go in as superior beings, like, oh, it, I really want to know how red-haired people talk. Can you tell me a little bit about that? You know. But So I just used Keith Basso's same 10 assertions. I didn't. I didn't elaborate on that at all because to me it's, the relationships were so precious and I don't mean that in a sweet way. I mean that the trust there was so important to me and the relationship was so important that I didn't want to, I didn't want to get fan, do any fancy footwork. I, I hope that answers your question. Do you guys have a question or a question? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 There's this phrase called interviewing up, where if I were to come interview you, it would be interviewing up because of your position in CVs and 
No, because I'm taller than you are, Kelly. <laughs> and don't forget it. That part I'll step in a chair, but the other part I think is really an interesting phrase, an interesting assumption that that exists, interviewing up. And I just wondered if you have any ideas about that. Well, I'm tr I have interviewed up, and I have felt in awe. I, I interviewed, uh, now I call him Rudy Anaya. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know the writer Rudolfo Anaya, who was so generous with his time with me. And um, I, I, my heart was beating when I, when I interviewed with him. And I, at the end I said, you know, Rudy, I, I really had no idea you would be so generous with, with your time. Thank you so much. And he said to me, well, that's a nice thing to say, Cheryl. He said, most white women say to me, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very small man, you know, very small, elegant man. But the interviewing up, I think, is one thing. Because if I feel a little shy, it's okay. Because I, it's me. But I certainly don't want to go interview and make anyone else feel bad or make them feel not as smart or not as educated or whatever. I, I don't think I was ever dishonest, but I certainly never went on a Pueblo dressed like I am today in this professional situation. I, I, I think I spoke exactly the same, but I wore jeans and a shirt, just like everybody else. Um, what I noticed from everyone I interviewed, and I interviewed about 50 people from various uh, pueblos in New Mexico, was that no one worried about their English. And that's not the same as when I talk to lots of other people who know I'm an English professor. And so, the language isn't always what we would consider standardized English. And that made me feel good that, that they weren't, people weren't saying, is this okay? Did, did I make mistakes? That never came up. I think it's very important not to, to not make somebody feel that you're interviewing down. Do, what do you think, Kelly? Oh, I, I agree with you. It's just, I guess the term interviewing up I, I became interested in it because the, the people I interviewed for my dissertation, that was one of them. He was up. And, you know, it was somebody, you know, there were all these people in the, in gener generation. Yeah, it's a generational like thing, yeah. Me, no, or, generation. Mm -hmm. But, but what, what the, a lot of what I was reading was talking about, you know, how do you interview up, how do you deal with that? And I ended up feeling that the data became the leveler, meaning um, that wasn't one, so don't ask me, but some people that I interviewed told me things that they said, well, you know what, let's not put that in anywhere, we'll, we'll publish that. And it ended up doing this leveling thing. It was, so there was no more interviewing up, it was two people talking. Yeah. And, I, yeah. and so I've just been kind of fascinated with the term. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And it is also interesting when the interviews become a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's the best, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing s some interviews with my new project, too, and I'm looking forward to getting back to it, yeah. It's a, a little practical question, just following off of, of Rebecca's. So here's four years building this kind of thing. So the, a practical question. You're a, you're a young researcher. Oh yeah. And uh, you know, trying to get over in the in the profession. Yeah. And certain kinds of projects have certain consequences or not. Is this is this research for a for a, 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 a new young professor? It could be if you didn't have to buy an airplane ticket. Oh, okay. Because you could you could do it. It would work faster if you could get to your research site more than you know, at top, tops four times a year, sometimes three, sometimes two, sometimes it's long distance. So if there were, I, I, I'm sure there are communities in Denver 
where this kind of work could be carried out with great success. And if you saw people more often, you could establish relationships m much earlier, trusting relationships much earlier. Yeah. So one could do it and get a piece of the research out earlier. I think that um, um, thinking about an Indian population is somehow romanticized nationally because it, it seems, well, Indians know that they've been romanticized. But there are a lot of, but their living conditions aren't very romantic, I have to say. There are many people whose who's culture and eth cultural and ethnic groups are not romanticized, and those would be wonderful resources that could connect with uh, community service, service learning, those sorts of things where students, undergraduate students could be involved as researchers as well, I think. About Tell me your name again. I'm Jeffrey. Jeffrey, yeah. yeah. I heard you actually introduce Dorothy Allison. At oh! The and, and I thank you because you made a comment that's actually making me think about a course differently than what we're doing in the winter. But you said, and I think you said this, and make sure I got it correctly, about how you always teach or often teach. Uh, always. always. I teach it no matter what. I mean, okay. I could be teaching computers and technology. I would never be teaching this. You know that, Matt. But let's <laughs> say I'd find a way to use two or three things I know for well, sure. My question for you would be, thinking in the, in the context specifically of, I mean, how you teach either that text or, or things about that text or, or related kinds of texts that are giving it some of the maybe difficult things, especially for first year students, and how you make that, how you make it work, you know, kind of, kind of thinking ahead about the potential resistance you might have to certain texts like that that get a little, you know, from my point of view, interesting, but for students might be potentially offensive or off-putting or way, you know, and how do you, how do you finesse that, or what, how do you approach it with students and make it really fit with the, the larger purpose of writing and what you're doing in your classrooms? That's a good question, Jeffrey. Um, well, there are two issues here. First is the title. Two or three things I know for sure. And I always have, and, and you know, it's a performance piece. I always have students start out by writing in class two or three things they know for sure. And then, I, and I do that in uh, Unspoken, too. I think I have some sort of introductory chapter where I, I, do, I mean, I only know a couple things for sure. <laughs> and I ask my students to do this too. Tell me a couple things they know for sure. Then we talk about how personal experience can come into one's writing without even being autobiographical. So that's another issue. How you build on what you already know and how you can start with your experiences to write. The third thing I talk about is the difference between truth and facts. And when students say to me, well, I looked uh, her up, and she doesn't have an older sister. And I mean, somebody, I was teaching <laughs> the last time, and they were trying to figure out who was born when, and blah, 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 blah. And, and so that always gives me this wonderful opportunity to talk about the difference between truth and fact. And to take my students to the Dorothy, uh, Dorothy, uh, Toni Morrison piece called The Sight of Memory. And it's in the William Zinser collection on the art and craft of memoir, I think. Mm -hmm. The Sight of Memory, where Toni Morrison says, the only truth is in literature. Facts don't <coughs> need people. <coughs> literature does. So we talk about it, two or three things we know for sure, in a, in a larger way, to see the larger strokes that we can use in our own writing. And I also have a rule that, well, Jen will know about, but maybe the rest of you don't, and you might not approve. But my, one of my rules is, we're going to read this stuff, and I don't care if you like it or not. I, I really don't care. You know, I don't want to hear that author should have done this, and I wish she'd done this, and I don't care. I don't care. Because it is what it is. So what can we get from it? How can we use it? What can you, what can you take from this novel or this performance piece to use in your own writing or your own thinking? It doesn't mean you have to, uh, you have to accept it, but how can you use it? I think Augustine in... Um, uh, De Doctrina, I think, talks about taking the gold out of Egypt. You know, you want the pagan gold, 
<laughs> you want that pagan gold. You want that golden calf. But you can't worship the golden calf. You just got to melt it down, get the money, and use it. So you want to take the gold out of Egypt. You want to take what you can out of two or three things, I know for sure, and use it for your own benefit. So those are some of the, of course, I've been teaching a long time, so I can get away with saying, it is what it is. You don't, I don't care if you like it. How can you use it? D does that answer your question at all? Yeah. Tell me your name again. John. John, hi. This is, I guess, kind of a follow-up to Jeffrey's question. I'm wondering about the relationship between some of the scholarly stuff that you've been talking about and the creation of the handbook. Oh, yeah. So how does the, something like the rhetoric <coughs> of silence, for example, enter into the way in which you construct the rhetoric that's part of the, of the How to Write Manual or into the, uh, you know, the, um, get a little tangled. And my thought is that I can imagine ways in which what you've talked about would sort of play out in terms of reading, right? That we yeah. have a, a set of readings that yeah. seem to address yeah. these issues. I'm wondering yeah. how does that inform the other more kind of formal or, or procedural yeah. aspects of the, the text? Well, um, I do something in, in some of my textbooks that some people consider old-fashioned, which is I think about the rhetorical situation. And I know a rhetorical situation is a construct. I know there's lots of controversy over whether the exigence is constructed or identified. Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? You got to have a reason to write. You know? And so I want or, or a reason to use language or to use silence. Now, Doug knows that I also use silence sometimes uh, when I, I, I might be sending a, um, a message that, you know, now's not a good time to talk or let's talk later. I, I really don't want to say anything I might regret. I, I just don't like to do that. I do it so often anyway. You'd think. <laughs> think what I'd be like if I didn't think about that, you know. So I think in my handbooks, I'm always thinking about the rhetorical situation. What's appropriate? What's appropriate to say, to do, or to, let, to, to leave unsaid? Who's your audience? Your purpose is always, you can't ever decouple purpose from audience. If you don't have a sense of audience, you don't know what your purpose is. If you don't have a purpose, you don't know who your audience is. I mean, those are linked. So I think the rhetorical principles carry over and go back and forth. And also, the whole idea about grammar, punctuation, mechanics, it really all depends on the situation, doesn't it? And we were talking at lunch about how we all make so many judgments about, not, we don't. Other people <laughs> make so many judgments about speakers or writers based on this corpus of mistakes that they think interfere, interferes with communication. It could be a misplaced comma. The, the worst one is the apostrophe. <laughs> the misused apostrophe, you know, the wrong homonym, something like that. So a handbook is a handbook of standardized English. And I don't think standardized English is always the appropriate language to use. So it's, I try to make it um, what's appropriate. Does, does that help? Yeah. Oh, you, yeah, well, we've got time. Yeah, no, I just want to make sure one. And I'm good at wait, at wait time. After working on silence, I can just sit here. <laughs> one, one of the other I've Jeffs. Got stuff ready okay, Jeff, okay. thanks. Um, ask you to put on the chair's hat for a second. Where is Forsey's hat? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a good question. I hope it's headed your way. Yes. <laughs> because the four C of all the NCTE affiliates, Four C's has the oldest population and the whitest. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so it's, I think it's going to be more and more important for, for the Four C's to find ways to invite younger members to participate and, um, and an even more diverse, diverse membership and to celebrate the diversity. 
now at the same time we need to find something that that uh, binds us all together don't we we've got the spellings commission weighing very heavy on us we're going to have much more besides the federal legislation we're going to have more and more state legislation my university president says won't touch me won't touch me it's going to touch state dollars absolutely and i think we have to find a way to coalesce to face down those challenges because we are not going to be in charge of writing programs in 20 years if we don't do something which means we have to decide who knows the most about writing and who, and that's why your research projects are so great because you're going to be producing materials that can be used in the defense of good writing programs and also as models of good writing programs so instead of Margaret Spelling sitting around I mean can you just imagine her joking around with Carl Rove about what you ought to be doing about writing programs well he's not there anymore but he'd have an opinion <laughs> or education or testing it has to be us and we have to find a way to uh, reclaim that turf what do you th what would you like for C's well, to and, be and, and, how could it be interesting to you huh. Uh, that, I, that, that would be a fair <laughs> question for you to ask me, considering the question I just asked yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I mean, I agree with your, your statement, especially since, I mean, that is the history of C's, is to reclaim ground, you know, whether it was open admissions, or whether it was students' rights to their own language, or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, we lost the open we admissions. Lost, yeah. but, We're losing but, student rights. Think yeah. about the, all the English only. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, the... We're doing a great job. And, and <laughs> for, for, yeah, we have greatest. For, for an organization to, to stake those claims, I think, is very different than, than uh, other humanities-based disciplines. And, yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, I like that. Answer. What do you want us to do, oh, though? Man, I couldn't answer. You can begin to answer. Yeah. That. I mean, it's kind of chilling. Mm -hmm. I taught a course this mm -hmm. summer for the Bread at the Breadloaf School of English on the language wars. That was one of the courses. The other one was on rhetoric and identity, which was fun. Uh, and it's shocking the way language is being legislated. Yeah. yeah. Well, now my questions aren't very good follow-ups to this, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm... Embrace well, the non -sequitur. Huh? <laughs> no, just say, moving in another direction. Yeah. Moving in another direction. Well, I guess one of the questions that I'm interested in knowing the answer to is um, looking back at your own work, what sort of lessons, what sort of assumptions, what sort of lessons have you learned either about research or um, the topics that you've selected? So maybe what sort of assumptions did you make? Um, you know, um, It's, you know, the yeah, thing, well, go ahead. And part of the reason I'm asking this question is I remember at Penn State, Cheryl would always be very candid about her own research process. And um, What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> you made some comments that I always thought were very refreshing and, and, and um, made me think that I could maybe actually do this in some ways. So <laughs> you've made some disparaging comments about some of the I don't want to go too far. <laughs> you know, it's so, it's so interesting. <laughs> it's so interesting what the teacher says and what the student hears. Well, you know. I remember that you used to say that you felt like you really had to back everything that you said. Oh, yeah, 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 I did. When I wrote about the, about the women. Asia, oh, man. And the Braddock Award. So yeah, early in your yeah, career, you I remember. Here. Yeah, I had, to, I had to back up. And I don't think that in spoken, I think um, certainly. Right. There isn't that level of... No. Badness. I think that um, the rhetoric retold, which is a, a history of women, um, I had to do twice as much research as anybody else to get those women out there because nobody believed they existed. And um, I remember Ed Corbett saying to me, you know, if you do negative research, that'll be great. And then we'll know for sure that there weren't any women. Mm -hmm. And I loved Ed Corbett. And you one time... Said that? <laughs> Not in joking? Oh, no. And <laughs> one time I was giving a paper at Four Seas on Aspasia, and Michael Halloran, another man I like very much, leaned over to Roxanne Mountfort and said, you've got to tell Cheryl she's got to quit talking about these women. And I could hear it on stage. <laughs> 
But at the same time, at that same presentation, Mr. Corbett stood up and said, I, I mean, I said, I took a rhetoric class, I took all the rhetoric classes and never studied a woman. Never. And I had asked Mr. We called him Mr. Corbett. I'd asked Mr. Corbett if there were any women, and he said that he had just seen a TV program with, um, oh, shoot, Tina Turner, and he thought there might be a rhetoric of the body. This was in a <laughs> long time ago. And, but, I mean, there was, he didn't have a clue, but when I was giving this Four C's talk, and Michael Halloran said, you've got to tell Cheryl she can't do this, Mr. Corbett stood up and said, Cheryl, I, I want to apologize to you and everybody in here for being such a sexist. It made me cry that he said that. <laughs> so they just didn't know. And I really had to work hard. I just felt there was something, something there. One thing I did, which helped me, was I sent out early drafts to Ed Corbett, Rich Enos, George Kennedy, Jerry Murphy, and said, would you help me? <laughs> And they would all write back and say, well, you didn't read, you didn't read what I wrote about this, that, and the other. And it just led me to such great materials that when, when, when my book came out, they were great. They were just great. And they were so happy. So that was, I mean, I let them criticize me and I took their help. They really were, they were the guys. They had done that kind of work. Um, not everybody who criticizes knows what he or she's talking about and hasn't done any of that kind of work. Yeah, yeah that happens too. But in that case, I was, I was really glad to have help. So m what I've learned is ask for help. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to take away your birthday. <laughs> no matter what. Then my birthday was Tuesday. You know, I had a great birthday. Yeah, it was great. I had a great birthday. Um, and that it's a lot of work. I also learned that we have, to, we have to share. We have to share material. We have to share help. And uh, we need to be working a lot more together. And not worry if I'm working on Aspasia and you're working on Aspasia. I mean, when, you know, I know you're not, but we can, we can work on it. We can, well, why not? Why not? Somebody else can do it better. Why not? And after all, there are, there are so many books written about Plato, Aristotle, all those guys. We need more work about the stuff, you know, more work on the stuff we're doing. Those are the th sorts of things I've learned. Nothing's easy. You don't feel good about your work long enough. <laughs> you know you feel really great when you pick up the three C and you see your name there. And then you look through it and you see your name at the top of every left hand. Oh, yes, you know. <laughs> and then you don't care. And then they, that's over with. Yeah. Doesn't last long enough. <laughs> the joy doesn't last long enough. That's one thing I've learned. With your interviewing process, um, you talked about creating a situation where you have. Uh, my dissertation actually is mostly consisting of interviews. Uh huh. Interviews. And you talked about how. You Learned, or your goal is to create a sort of collaborative interview. I think that's really hard to do. How did you learn how to create that sort of interview? I think my friend Roxanne Mountfort told me I had to do it mm -hmm. because I really didn't know about it. And she said, you've got to. And Diane Davis at Texas said too. And that was really helpful. So I just did it. I just, you know, I, I, I what was important to me was keeping my relationships with people I was interviewing. You don't want to interview somebody and then never want to see them again. You want to have, you know, you want to be able to send Christmas cards to people. I think, well, and my interviews were mostly, uh, there was a real power differential in the interviews. So were you the powerful one? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you may never want no, to see them again. So, oh. Um, <laughs> Well, they may not care. I, I mean, I think that's going to happen no matter what. I think that you, 
you, that's going to happen no matter what, because you think you're hearing correctly. But we can only hear and read through our own terministic screens, and people can only write and speak through their terministic screens. There's always going to be a gap there. But I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Rebecca. Related to what you were talking about um, earlier with, with Corbett, um, um, what inspired you to originally write about Aspasia in the um, Sex, Lies, and Manuscript essay? Because nobody had really done any work on women in, in rhetoric books. So I was wondering what your, your inspiration was. What, I really, I was taking rhetoric, I was going to be a sociolinguist, and I was going to do gendered language, and my linguistics professor gave me the creeps. Le uh, two years ago, he murdered his wife, and he was a professor at K-State and murdered his wife, so I was right to get rid of him. <laughs> yeah, anyway, he left Ohio State. Um, and I started taking these rhetoric classes. That was important. That's how I, because he just was creeped me out. So I thought, well, I'm going to try this. I took these rhetoric classes, and I loved them. And I was taking lots of medieval Renaissance. Loved it, loved it, loved it. And, but there was no place for me in rhetoric. I mean, Krista Ratcliffe and I were in the same, I call her Chris. Chris Ratcliffe and I were in the same rhetoric class, classes, and Roxanne Mountfort. And, I mean, we couldn't get Mr. Corbett to, there was no place for us. So it's really awful to be in rhetorical studies and not see any place for you. And think about that with all of our students who are non-white. Think about that. Think about that. And I needed to find, I needed to find some women I, who had done something. Because how was I going to be in this field if there was nobody ever like me ever? Now it seems so old-fashioned to even say something like that. Um, you know, it's corny. But Jackie Royster hadn't written anything. Shirley Logan hadn't written anything. Krista Ratcliffe hadn't written it. Nobody had written. I mean, there was nothing. And I was having dinner one night at Four Seas with Cindy Self. Um, who was that lovely man at Texas? Jim Canavy, mm -hmm. Mr. Corbett. We were having dinner together, and I said, I really wanted to do something on women in rhetoric. I was thinking medieval women. I've done a lot of work on medieval women, too. And Cindy Self said, I wrote a little paper for Jim Canavy on Aspasia. Why don't I send that to you? She sent me this little seven-page paper that she'd written. She tried to get it published in three C's, and Ed Corbett wouldn't accept it. <laughs> seven pages long. Right. That was all the material she could find. <laughs> <laughs> and she mailed that to me, and I was off and running. And I thought, damn it, I am going to find some stuff on Aspasia. So I went to a couple archives and found some stuff. So Cindy really helped me. Wow. But this is how four C's works. If you need help, somebody's going to say, you know, I tried that. It didn't work out. Let me send you what I've got, and you go from there. And we've got, the more of that we do, the, that's the only way to, to get our, save our profession, really. How is Cindy Self doing that sort of work? She does, she's on my dissertation. Okay, like Cindy, Cindy Self can't help it. She's, <laughs> she's omnicompetent. <laughs> so if she, if, oh, she's probably got something in her back pocket. She'll just hand it over to you. The best thing she's ever seen. Absolutely the best. Yeah, she's, she, she does all sorts of stuff. But that's another great thing about our field. You know, you can, you can ride on Aspasia one week and go out to a reservation the next week and, you know, I had a chapter on, on uh, deaf silences. Hmm. The use of silence in deaf communities, capital D and lower case D, deaf. And the reviewers all said I had to take it out because they couldn't help it. These are people who had never oh. been on Gallaudet campus where I stayed many times. So that's still floating around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I had to take it out. I, I still don't understand why. They can't help it. 
They're naturally silent. Yeah, and it was the noisiest place I'd ever been, Gallaudet. I wanna, thank you, thank you, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you.